Well, I have noticed uh, this morning, and I noticed it a few times, and I noticed it Wednesday night, that I'm not the old guy in this crowd that's getting older. I noticed Roger had to put his glasses on when he went to the piano this morning, and then I noticed that our young evangelist Wednesday night had to have his glasses on. And I noticed he was struggling as I struggled with my glasses when I got 40 years of age. And uh, when I went to the doctor and I told him I was having difficulty reading my Bible when I stood up, he said, oh, your arm's getting too short. <laughs> he said, we can do one of two things. We can extend the length of your arm or we can put some glasses on. And so uh, <laughs> I put glasses on. So it made me feel a little bit better. I'm not the only fellow around here who's getting older. Amen. In fact, all of us are getting that way, are we not? Amen. Would you pray with me this morning and let's ask the Lord for his special help. Father, we cast ourselves upon your mercy and your grace this morning. We cry out to you from the depth of our souls this morning for help from your word. Take this feeble human vessel this morning and help me to be a blessing to the listening ears of those who are in this room. Lord, I pray you would not only challenge us this morning, but convict us and help us, Lord, to openly give ourselves to you by faith. If there's spiritual need in this room this morning, someone who's not saved, I want to pray right now for their salvation. If there's someone here this morning that's saved and out of the will of God, I want to ask you right now, Lord, touch their life and help them this morning to realize the tragedy of where they are. And Lord, get it right with you and get back in a walk of fellowship with you. Thank you for your help and your touch and your breath on us this morning. In Jesus' name I pray and ask. Amen. I want to take you this morning to a time-worn passage in God's Word. Turn with me to Second Chronicles chapter number 7. I have uh, wrestled with the Lord over this passage uh, for the last two weeks and uh, could not get it off my heart and get away from it. And so I have learned that when God presses something to your heart, you'd best listen to Him. Second Chronicles chapter number 7. We'll come to our text in just a moment. If you look at this seventh chapter of Second Chronicles, you will, you will find it records for us a very joyous time in the lives of Solomon, the king, and of God's people, the nation of Israel. The temple has been finished. The temple that David raised money for that wanted to build and God would not allow him to because of some disobedience in his life. And then God used Solomon to build that temple. That temple has been finished. Uh, chapter 6, Solomon has prayed a great prayer of dedication. Sacrifices have been made that were ordained by the hand of God in the temple. And immediately in verse 1 of this chapter, the Bible says that the glory of the Lord filled the house. Oh my, I would, uh, I would have loved to have been there, would you? Uh, there, there's, there's nothing that happens in the house of God that is quite like the glory of the Lord filling his house. As a result of the glory of the Lord filling the house, the Bible tells us that there was great joy in the hearts of God's people. And that's always true. There's always joy when the Lord shows up in his house. All of that sets the scene for the verses that I want us to consider this morning, beginning down in verse number 11. If you'll drop down there with me and we'll read down through verse number 15. The Bible says, Thus Solomon finished the house of the Lord, obeying the Lord, following God's directions, and had finished the house, not only that, but the king's house, the place for the king to live. And all that came into Solomon's heart to make in the house of the Lord and, his own, and in his own house, he prosperously 
effected. Verse 12, And the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said unto him, I have heard thy prayer and have chosen this place to myself for a house of sacrifice. Verse 13, If I shut up heaven that there be no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin, and will heal their land. Now mine eyes shall be open, and mine ears attent unto the prayer that is made in this place. God knew well the hearts of his people, just as he knows well my heart and your heart this morning. And God knew very well, even though they are in a time of great rejoicing, they're in a time of great celebration over the presence of God being among them in, in the house of the Lord. God knew that in the days ahead, they would likely stray from his word. And because of that, he issues a very stern warning there in verse 13. He said, if I shut up heaven, that there be no rain. I send drought. Or if I command the locusts to devour the land, if I send pestilence across the land, or if I send pestilence among my people, disease of all kinds among my people. The warning of God in that verse is very, very plain. And that warning is this, that sin and rebellion in the life of his people will be followed by judgment. God says... If I shut up heaven, if I send locusts to devour your crops, there's no food. If I send disease among you as a people, if I, if I do all this, that's my judgment upon you and it's my calling you to a place that we read about in verse number 14. Sin and rebellion always bring the judgment of God. Whether it's an individual whether it's a church, whether it's a nation. Sin and rebellion in our lives always brings the judgment of God. And, and let me say, beloved, that truth never changes. From one generation to the next, that truth never, never changes. What is so marvelous here is that immediately following that warning, God issues what has to be one of the greatest promises that is ever found in the word of God. Look at verse 14. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. This morning we are living in the most dangerous time that our that our nation has ever seen. We're living in a time that is more dangerous than the days when Japan bombed Pearl Harbor. We're living in days that are more dangerous than those days when terrorists attacked our nation on 9-1-1. Our country this morning is in serious trouble. Our churches this morning are in serious trouble. And our families in America today are in serious trouble. Literally, we are facing troubles today that, that could totally destroy the America that you and I have known. Most of us in this room are, are with the exception of, of a few, are, are beyond 50 years of age. And the America that we have known could well be destroyed as a result of what's taking place in our land. In times past, as enemies attacked our country from without, 
God's people filled the churches and prayed and the enemy was defeated. We, we have seen that take place time and again. This morning, the enemy is no longer without, but the enemy is strongly embedded within. Unfortunately, the key element that is missing today is the spiritual strength of God's people in our churches. For almost 50 years now, we have had people in various places of leadership in our nation who felt like it would be much better to remove the constraint of God and his word from our society. And they have steadily moved forward with their program, removing the Bible from our schools, removing prayer from our schools, taking down the Ten Commandments from, from uh, public buildings and, and outlawing public praying in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hadn't been but just a few years ago, we had a fellow out of this church who was serving as, uh, as a chaplain at the, uh, uh, at the Air Force Reserve Unit here in Chattanooga. Uh, and uh, uh, they, they handed down uh, a, 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 uh, an order that, that no longer could the chaplain stand and pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. He came to me, but Charlie Kern, he came to me and said, I, I can't go. I said, I couldn't either. I, I will not go anywhere that I cannot pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and he, he resigned from that position as an unpaid, uh, well, I, I say unpaid, a very little pay, about uh, probably half enough money to get gas to go there and back. But we're seeing all that take place. Most all of this has been done under the guise of concern over the rights of others. We don't want to trample on the rights of anybody. Well, I, I don't want to trample on the rights of anybody, but, but I don't think you and I as God's people ought to forfeit our rights uh, as God's people to pray and worship the Lord just because some heathen out in the world uh, does, feels uh, bothered by that or, or it causes him to have uh, adverse feelings about that. Why, why, why give up our relationship to God because of that? Today, the Ten Commandments no longer count. And as a result, stealing and murder and adultery and homosexuality and child pedophilia and divorce and on and on and gone. I could go this morning and you know where we are. You read those things. You don't, you don't live uh, uh, in, a, in a dark place where those things don't reach you. All those things are rampant around us this morning. The bottom line is simply this. When a nation, when a people disregard God and his word, internal rot begins. And that's exactly where we are in America this morning. And as a result of this, God sends judgment. If I shut up heaven, that there be no rain, he said. Or if I command the locusts to devour the land, he says. Or if I send pestilence among my people, he says. Judgment begins. In Jeremiah chapter 10 and verse number 10, the Bible said, but the Lord is the true God. He is the living God and an everlasting king. At his wrath, the earth shall tremble and the nation shall not be able to abide his indignation. I have no doubt this morning that God is indignant with America today. Yes. We want to hold our heads high and mighty in America under the banner of our American flag. And I honor that flag this morning. We want to hold our heads high and say God must be indignant with China or with Russia or with Venezuela or with Cuba or, or with all these other places. But I declare unto you this morning, beloved, I have to believe that where we are as a nation this morning, that God is equally indignant with America this morning. And fearfully, I say this morning, not only with America, but I believe with his people as well. You see, slowly but steadily, we have moved further and further away from God over the past number of decades. 
And as we have done that, we have worked to explain it away, telling ourselves that nobody is perfect, that what's going on is just a result of nobody being perfect. Let me give you a good illustration of that, okay? In 1939, uh, there was a film came out entitled Gone with the Wind. It was the first film that Hollywood produced that had a curse word in it. The very first word, very first curse word that ever came out in a film. Why? Because the American public would not put up with that sort of language. But that film came out. And it kind of stung Americans and, and especially church people a little bit. They were a little uncomfortable with that word for a little while. But it didn't take them long to get over with it. The devil used that to begin to condition the minds and the hearts of God's people with this thought. Nobody's perfect. We're not living in a perfect world. This is how it is. And look at where we are today. Now I have Christians come to me all the time and I, I have folks occasionally ask me, Did, have you and your wife been to the theater? My wife and I don't go to the theater. I, I guess the last film we saw at a theater, we were on vacation and we went to see The Lion King. It, that tells you where we are. Hello? I don't go to the theater. You say, why don't you go to the theater? I don't go to the theater because I, number one, I don't want God seeing me there. Number two, I don't want to ruin my Christian testimony by seeing going in and out of a filthy place like that. What we've done, we've got, we've gone, and, and I have folks say, have you seen such and such a movie? Now, preacher, I know there's some bad words in it, and there's some scenes. If there are bad words and there's scenes in it, then, then we as God's people have no part of, of it. No, we have no reason to be a part of that. Amen? Amen. If you went home from lunch, for lunch today and sat down, your wife set your food on the table and, and, and laying right in the middle of, of your, your, your cream potatoes was a great big cockroach, what would you do? You throw it out. She said, but, but he's not eat much. And every cockroach needs a little to eat. You say, I have no part of that whatsoever. Well, listen, when we condition our minds to accept those things, they begin to flood in. We've passed that philosophy. I'm talking to us now. Hear me. The tragic thing is, you and I have passed that philosophy on to our children. Our kids, and even our grandkids. And they've done a good job not only of embracing all of that, but of enhancing it in their lives. And we become a proud nation, wallowing in our materialism and rotting in our sin this morning. It is a fact this morning that America has become the greatest polluter of the world. This crowd, this crowd screaming about pollution and, and certainly we ought to take care of everything God has entrusted into our hands. But we as, as Americans have become the greatest polluters the world has ever known. Our motion picture industry spews out its filth around the world like an open sewer just flooding the world. Social media is literally filled with a flood tide of filth and perversion and, and, and everything under heaven. Along with this, we're living in days of cruelty above measure. We, we, have, never, we, have, we have never witnessed in, in our culture, in our society, in America, the cruelty that's taking place. These are not only days of wickedness, but they're days of excessive wickedness. I realize this morning that the so-called cancel culture of our day would call this message extreme right-wing rhetoric. But I say unto you what I'm sharing with you is the word of God this morning. And it's not a matter of left or right or Democrat or Republican, but it's the, it is a matter of right or wrong. And God's word is always right. Well, that's, that's, all oh, that's bad stuff. I mean, that's bad stuff. I, I don't even like to come to the pulpit and, and, and stand here and, and tell you all that because it's bad, it's awful. But it's reality. And the question that I'm faced with and that you're faced with this morning as a child of God, as a Christian, 
as sip of this. What are we going to do about it? Oh, but you say, preacher, we're just a ruminant. I, I'm not talking about how few we are. I'm talking about what, what are you as a, as a Christian going to do about it? I want us to take a few minutes this morning and, and I want us to look at four all important truths from this passage that we're looking at. In verse number 14. Very compelling truths for my life and for your life as a Christian this morning. The Lord has said to, to Israel, if judgment comes, if I shut up the heavens, if I, if I, if I command the locusts to devour the land, if I send pestilence among the people, the Lord says, if my people which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. There are four very compelling truths in that verse this morning that ought to challenge our hearts to the very core. I want you to look first of all at the people God addresses here. Who is he talking to? If who? My people, which are called by my name. Somebody would say, but preacher, this is Old Testament. This, this is the book of 2 Chronicles. God is addressing the nation of Israel. I, I totally agree with you. I, I, have no, I have no argument with you about that at all. But I ask you this this morning. Are we any less God's people this morning than the nation of Israel was here? We're blood-bought this morning. Jesus Christ went to Calvary to die for our sins. In fact, the Bible tells us in the New Testament that Christ died for the church. And so I would submit to you this morning that this message is as relevant to God's people today as it was to the nation of Israel right here in 2 Chronicles chapter 7. If my people, the message that is given here is to God's people and the promise connected to that message is predicated on what God's people do. One of the dangers that I see is how so many of God's people today are talking about our help coming from midterm elections. I hear it here at the church. I'm concerned about elections. Don't, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I'm not scolding you about thinking about midterm elections or the next presidential election. We ought to be concerned about that. Surely, but our help, our help, if we get any help, is not going to come from the midterm elections or the next presidential election. It'll not be a political party that leads the church and America back to God. It's going to have to come from God or through his people, the church. Amen. The question this morning is, are you one of his people? Are you a Christian this morning? If you are, then you need to stop putting the blame on somebody else. The truth is, if America falls, it's going to be my fault and it's going to be your fault. I, I'm, not, I'm not in any way at all trying to put you on a guilt trip this morning. Please don't misunderstand what I'm saying this morning. I, what I'm trying to do is get you to understand where responsibility lies this morning. The responsibility does not lie in Washington. The responsibility lies right here in the hearts and the lives of God's people. I know a lot of folks this morning who would say, well, if only God would. Listen to what I'm going to say. We're not waiting on God this morning. Are you hearing me? We're not waiting on God this morning. Do you somehow think that the reason we're in the state we're in is because God has been indifferent to all that's going on? Uh, do, do we think that our God in heaven is not noticing what's going on here? It's not our duty to persuade God to send revival. Our responsibility is to put ourselves in a place and permit him to send revival among his people. It is not will God, but it is will we it's not a question of whether or not God will. God says, if you do this, I will do this. Let me remind you of the words of Peter in 1 Peter 4 and verse 17. 
He said the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. The hope of America is not in the White House. It's not in the State House. It's not in the School House. The hope of America is in God's house. And I'm concerned about every one of those. But I'm telling you this morning, the hope of America is in the house of God. That's the important fact I want to instill in your mind, hopefully in your heart this morning. And above all else, you'll go away from here with this message ringing in your heart. Listen, listen, I am a part of the group that, that, that can make revival possible. It is my responsibility. It is our responsibility as the people of God. The hope of my family, your family, the hope of my church, your church, the hope of my America, the hope of your America lies in the house of God, in the hands of God's people. I see, first of all, the people God addresses, if my people. Secondly, I see the pride God abhors. Look at it. If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves. What is wrong with America this morning? We are a nation this morning that is reeking with pride. We are a nation that is literally strutting in the face of Almighty God today. And it is that pride that keeps God's hand of blessing from our lives. God cannot bless us individually. God cannot bless uh, us as a family. God cannot bless us as a church. God cannot bless our nation when we, when we are so filled with pride. Over the years, humanism has crept into the church. I, I, and I'm not saying necessarily preach from pulpits, but because of what we're involved in every day, what we watch on television, what we read on social media, what we read in the paper, what we read in our magazines. Humanism has crept in, and somehow or other, we've got the idea that we're making our lives. And, and it's our responsibility for, for, for whether or not our lives are going to be blessed and whether or not we're going to have the smile of God on our lives. And so we, we literally strut through this world in the face of God. Pride is literally the root of all kinds of evil. The Lord says here, first of all, if you want me to bless you, it's going to involve this. You're going to have to humble yourselves. Notice carefully the admonition here. He doesn't say, let me humble you. He says, humble yourselves. Amen. Now I can tell you this morning, it is no problem at all for God to bring humility in our lives. God, God knows how to jerk the carpet out from under us. God knows how to bring us down on our faces. But I'll tell you this morning, it's a whole lot better if we'll humble ourselves. James 4 and verse 6 says, But he giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Have you, ever, have you ever stopped to think about God resisting you? I, I, I've known what it's like in days past of dealing with resistance among people. I, I've known what it's like even in my family to feel that resistance. I've known what it's like as a father to feel that resistance. But I will tell you, that's not anything. That 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 that, that doesn't even. It's not even on the scale to measure when you think about God resisting you, God resisting America, God resisting our families, God resisting our church, God setting Himself in battle array against us. James says, "God resisteth the proud." But oh, I'm glad he didn't stop there, but he says he giveth grace to the humble. Now here's the question. Do you have any pride? Do you have any pride? I, I'm, 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 not, I'm not talking... I, understand what I'm talking about here. I, I'm not talking about... I'm not talking about wanting to, to live a clean life, a respectable life. I appreciate my mom teaching my brother and I to have some pride in our appearance. When I grew up, we didn't have an awful lot. We had two changes of clothes, two changes of underwear. Most of the time I was a boy growing up. 
Uh, we had one pair of shoes. Well, actually, we had two pair. We had one, one pair we wore during the week and a second pair we wore on Sunday. But I will tell you what my mom taught us. Have some pride in yourself. And, 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 and her intent and all that was to... You, you, you ought to set yourself forth as an example of somebody who cares. Somebody who cares about your family. And, and mom took great, she took great pleasure in executing things. Well, we never did leave the house to go to school in the morning until she checked our ears and, and all those things. We didn't go to school with dirty ears. We didn't go to school with dirty clothes. Mother always had one set of clothes ready to change. We, we just didn't go dirty. And our shoes, we didn't go. Listen, so, so Saturday night, one of the last things we did on Saturday night was sit down uh, there in, in the living room and with, a, with a piece of newspaper in front of us and to polish and polish our shoes and shine them, get ready to go to church. Mom said, you're going to the house of the Lord tomorrow. You ought to look your best. Amen. That's not the kind of pride I'm talking about. I'm talking about the pride that wants to throw its chest out toward God. And say to God, look at me. Look at how I'm doing. Do you have any pride? you boast in your income? you, you boast in your job? you you boast in your stature of life? you boast in your, your education? I, I just remind you this morning that God's laws are eternal. He resisteth the proud, but He giveth grace to the humble. What I need, what you need, what our church needs, and what America needs is not judgment. But what we need this morning is the grace of God. Do you know what grace is? Grace, grace is both the desire and the ability to do the will of God. And only God can put that in our hearts. We, 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 we cannot create that in our hearts. God has to do that. We have to humble ourselves before him and cry out for that. That's grace. God giving us the strength to live as we ought to live. I can't live for the Lord unless he gives me that strength to live for him. So point number one as I look in this verse is the people God addresses, if my people. Point number two is the pride God abhors. God says, if my people shall humble themselves. Point number three is this, the prayer that God answers. The word pray, pray here in this verse means to entreat. It means to make supplication. It literally means to cry out. Prayer in our life is communication with God. The Bible makes it so clear that God doesn't hear or answer every prayer that we pray. Now that's true not only in our personal lives, in our own personal time, private time, but also as we even pray in church. God doesn't always answer those, uh, the, the, those prayers that we call praying and, and send up to Him. In fact, as we read this verse, we see a couple of qualifications that He places in the prayer that He answers. First of all, it's a prayer that seeks God's face. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face. In Psalms 34 and verse 4, the psalmist said, I sought the Lord, and he heard me and delivered me from all of my fears. Analyze your prayer life. We, we all ought to, now and then, we ought to analyze our prayer. What do you mean, analyze your prayer life? I, I mean, think about what you're praying. Look, look, at, look at how you're praying. What does your prayer life consist of? It's sad, but most of the time, our prayer life consists of give me. Do this for me. Do this for my family. Give me this. Instead of seeking the face of God. I, I fear greatly that the major problem in America today among God's people is that we're, we're not seeking the face of God. We're seeking the hand of God. We don't want to see him. We want to see what his hand can give us. And our cry in so many ways is this, oh God, do something. And I will tell you this morning, God is doing something. He is judging this nation. I don't say that, I don't say that with a joyful note in my voice. I will tell you this morning, God is judging this nation. And I fear this morning that he's judging his church. And I'm not talking about this church in particular. I'm talking about his church in this world. In fact, I will tell you the biggest threat we face today is not terrorism or socialism. The biggest threat we face today is God himself. 
Here's the question. Who else but God can deliver us? Who else but God can help us? Certainly it's not the Democrats. It's not the Republicans. When was the, when was the last time you got on your knees and you really sought the face of God? God, I'm down here and I'm not going to get up until I see the face of God. God, I, I'm seeking you. I, I want you in my life. Notice secondly here the prayer that God answers involves not only seeking his face but repenting of our sin. My people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Now, those words turn from my wicked ways literally means repentance. The word wicked here means determined, willful disobedience. It is bowing up our neck against God and His will and going against it. One old preacher said praying for revival without repentance is a religious farce. Boy, how true that is. What is Bible repentance? What is it after all? I can tell you it's more than conviction of sin. But the Bible tells us in Acts 24 about, a, about a, a ruler by the name of Felix that Paul preached to and, and the Bible describes what happened in, in the life of Felix that they trembled like the leaf under the preaching of God's word. He was convicted of his sin. But he would not repent. In fact, he said to Paul, go thy way for this time when I have a convenient season. I'll call for thee. Repentance is more than conviction. Repentance is more than confession of sin. I've been reading in Exodus, Miss Janet and I have been reading in Exodus in our devotion time in the morning and, and that portion of scripture as Moses has stood before Pharaoh pleading for him to let God's people go to release the children of Israel to allow them uh, to leave the land of Egypt. God sent plagues, you know, from your reading to Egypt to convict Pharaoh that, that he might turn from his sin who you know how, what happened time and again as the, the plagues came and he called for uh, Moses to come in and say, entreat the Lord, I've sinned uh, and let the frogs leave, let the lice leave, let the marine leave, let, let the water clear up, get the blood out of the water, I've sinned. And Moses would go and entreat the Lord and God would remove the plague. But the problem was when the storm died, the conviction and confession of sin disappeared. Repentance is more than conviction of sin. It's more than confession of sin. Repentance is more than contrition for sin. When I say contrition, I'm talking about feeling sorry about your sin. Repentance is more than shedding tears. I've stood in this place here and over in that old building so many times on a Sunday morning and a Sunday night and I've watched folks come down the aisle and get in the altar and pray. I, I'm thinking about I'm thinking about a couple right now that I saw in this altar on a Sunday morning weeping, praying. They didn't tell me, but I could tell by, by their countenance and by what was going on around them that they were in a struggle in their marriage. They got here in this altar and they wept. And they got up holding hands and walked out of this altar and went back to their place and sat down. They left this building that, that morning and within a week's time I was told that they had divorced. Repentance is more than feeling sorry about your sin. I've watched it over and over again. You, you've got to do more than weep here in the altar. It's got to get you out the door and get you apart from the sin in your life. Real repentance is a turning, a wholehearted change in your life. Repentance is a negative thing, but it's also a very positive thing. We turn from our wicked way and we seek the face of God. I, I got to remind you again, we're looking at this, but I got to remind you again because it's so easy for us to get, forget here. The message in this verse is not, it, it is not to the pornographer. The message here is not to the dope dealer. The, the message here is not to the thief or to the adulterer. But the, the message here in, the, in this verse is to God's people. If my people, the Lord says, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. What a wonderful word is the next word in this verse. Then, 
will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. I see lastly the promise that God activates. I've been asked and I have asked the question, is it too late for America? Have we crossed a threshold that we cannot return from in America this morning? I, I, I will tell you as I stand here this morning, I have no idea. But what I can do is stand here this morning and tell you that the God who sent revival on Mount Carmel, the God who sent revival to the wicked city of Nineveh, the, the God who sent revival to Jerusalem, the God who sent revival to Wales, the God who sent revival to America during the Great Awakening, I can tell you this morning that God is still alive, that God is well this morning, and this promise is as real here on this November morning as it has ever been. The mighty God who rules from heaven this morning says, If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. I remind you again, we're not talking about the liquor dealers. We're not talking about the Hollywood crowd. We're not talking about the pornography pushers. We're, we're not talking about this drug crowd. God is talking to who? His people. Put it plain to me as I read this that when the church gets right, when we begin to do what we ought to do, then we'll see all these other problems that we're so concerned about dealt with. God says, I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin. And I will heal their land. We've been praying every night at 7.30 or at other times that are more convenient for our families our churches and our country. I will tell you this morning, outside the working of God that's talked about in this verse, we're in for real trouble ahead. We have seen trouble, but there's a storm of trouble ahead. It is a fact that we're not honoring God as we used to honor God. It is a fact this morning that God's judgment is upon us and that even greater judgment is ahead. I pray that everything's well in your family, but I, things are not well in my family. I, I've got grandkids that are unsaved. I've got family members, uh, intimate family members that are, that are not right with God, not living for the Lord as they ought to. Our families are in trouble. Our churches are in trouble. And this great nation that you and I are a part of this morning is in trouble. And I say again, I don't know if we've crossed the threshold of no return or not. But what I am telling you this morning, if, if ever there were a time that we need to seek God's face and repent of our sin, this is the time that it ought to be done. It is time for America to pray. It, our hope this morning is in only one place. And that's in the God who rules from heaven this morning. I'm going to ask you if you would to bow your heads and stand with me. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed all over this the room this morning. If you're here this morning and you're not saved, I, I'm going to invite you to come and trust Christ as your Savior this morning. You need somebody to help you pray. Please, please don't leave without asking somebody to help you pray and get the Word. If you're lost and you need help, or get somebody with, get their Bible and help you with that. If you're here as a Christian this morning and, and you're away from the Lord and you know you're not really where God wants you to be, you ought to be down here and get that right with God this morning. Don't, don't let this time slip away from you. But then I'm going to ask the church this morning. I'm going to ask the remnant this morning of God's people to join me 
down here in this altar this morning. And we're going to close our time in praying this morning and doing what God tells us to do uh, in this verse. If you can't bow on the altar because of knee problems, sit on the front pews. But if you recognize, if you realize, if in your heart you see what we've been talking about as a reality this morning, I don't know how we can sit in our pews and fold our hands and go home and do nothing. Would you join me as the music begins this morning and we'll pray.